Hi, Chaco. Hi. So some people know who you are. Who yes, are you? Yes. Oh, I am actually a PM here, uh, working on the services uh, in Service Fabric. So you had a pretty cool interview with Charles where you talked about Service Fabric Mesh. So yes. for the people that haven't seen it, they should go see that. Yes, they yeah. should. So let's continue where we are with this rapid fire right. question. So first question for you is, uh, if I have a application that has multiple services that are all listening on a commonly used port like 443, uh, and they all require secure access, or so HTTPS, what happens when I need to go upgrade the certificate behind one of them? So this is a problem which happens when uh, a customer is, sh is actually sharing the same cluster uh, for multiple applications, which actually is the common use case which we have. Uh, so this is something which typically customers uh, hit if they are not designed their apps well. So in this particular scenario where you just talked about, basically you're saying there are multiple applications, so there are actually different packages, there are different, uh, they're all hosted on the same mach same machine, and, but they're all listening to the same port. Yeah. So if certainly if one of them updates the certificate, then the rest of them, unless they're using the uh, yeah, so they are they are they're out of luck, yeah. right? So uh, the main reason for it, like I, th I think, uh, is basically you when you share share ports, uh, there is no easy way to upgrade the SSL cert which is used to tackle that port. So the best pattern to do that at that point is if there is a need like that, is to have a common gateway, which then routes routes the requests which come in on S on SSL to the backends, and then you're just updating one. You don't run into any of those issues. Okay, cool. And now that you know you have a long history on this team working on, on delivering service fabric as a service on Azure, so I want to ask you a lot of questions from the infrastructure side of things as well. So first question for you that I have is, uh, some people have seen this concept of FDs and UDs, so they've got fault domains and upgrade domains. Can you tell us a little bit about why they're so important in their like relationship to each other? Okay, so fault domains basically is our way of service fabrics way of of describing infrastructure. So basically saying the way you should think about it is anything any disasters which you don't control, like for example a Tor update, the top of the rack updates, or a PDU burned out, or a complete rack going out. This is an Azure machine, data center. Yeah, data data, or even the even your own data center. In your data center maybe you just have a machine. Uh, so you still still have like two units of power coming in then one of your FDs could be the power. So FDs are basically a logical way for us, for you to describe to Service Fabric that in logical, infra that your physical infrastructure. So the way I would describe FDs would be things you don't control and can randomly pass away or you know just, just die. Yeah. Or just have you having to take the whole thing down. Like PDU is, or Tor is a great, great thing. When you update, for example, the firmware, it's going to take half your machines down. So that will be an FD. And if one thing goes down in FD, the assumption we make is everything in that FD is... Oh, of course, it's thing. gone, right? So uh, so that's where the good example, which I always give is, for example, in some large data centers, they will have three separate networks coming in, so then they have three FDs there. But anyway, so that's just at the end of, at the end, what do you want to survive, right? You can even talk, talk about even in Azure, now customers have started to talk about Azure zones as one FD. So that's what is FD. UDs are basically a very controlled way of, of telling service fabric, like, bring down these percentage of machines or nodes down at a given point. That's what UDs are. In Azure, of course, you don't control UDs or FDs. We just give you five and five. Right. Uh, and so this just means that UDs are, are the way uh, the max number of machines uh, which are brought down or nodes which are brought down on any upgrade, whether it's application upgrade or whether it's, it's uh, fabric upgrades. So w does the number of FDs have to resemble the number of UDs? So you said 5 and 5, there's some symmetry there. Why couldn't they have had like 15 UDs and 5 FDs? Actually, when you, when you go to large clusters, like 1,000 node clusters and so forth, you would see, the, see that you don't want to lose 200 nodes like at a time, right? That's that like getting those many down right. would mean that much of headroom is required. So yes, you actually can have uh, more than five or whatever makes sense to you. Uh, basically, it all comes down to the capacity which you have as a headroom on top. So I always say in terms of capacity planning, uh, think about uh, trying to survive one FD going down, one UD being down and a random machine going down. 
that's how you should plan your capacity. And so hopefully that answers your, answers your question. Yeah, it definitely does. But it also brings me to now think about when I come to Azure and I want to create a cluster, I create a node type. And in that node type, I'm only allowed between three and 100. Well, I'm allowed one and then I can't pick two, then I go from three to 100. So can you explain why I can pick one and then suddenly pick three and then from three, why is it only a hundred? You just told me I can have a thousand node cluster. Ah, so this, <laughs> this is good. So uh, the limitations of hundred is what you're trying to say. So service fabric as a technology doesn't have a limit. Uh, we, we do not know of a limit. I'm sure there is a limit somewhere. Uh, physical limits exist. It's the largest cluster you've seen. Yeah, so the largest one was the one which we did for Mark Russ's 1 billion container demo, right? That was around 3,500 machines. Uh, those are large, nice, nice big <laughs> machines, right? So, now, yeah, so uh, this, this uh, I want to call it FUD. Can I use the word FUD? Mm -hmm. <laughs> About this 100 machines is wrong. Okay. Right. So service fabric allows you to have one node type span multiple VMSs. So now it doesn't allow you to do that all the time. So there are some limitations which we are, which we will start to fix. Basically, is if you have, say, example, a durability level of silver, now there are some bugs we found, and so we would fix that. And once that is the case, then for one node type, whether it's a primary or secondary, you can actually have any number of VMSs you want. So this hundred doesn't exist. Now, what is this hundred? This 100 actually was a limitation which was initially put together to, uh, to work around a, a allocation problem which, which we had in compute where basically we, we could not find, uh, find enough, uh, enough capacity, that's one. And then secondly, also sometimes to get that much of free capacity is difficult. So basically we say it's a single tenant, so tenant. Tenant is basically one one deployment from a compute perspective, and so they just limited it to hundred for for basically to guarantee to us that the FDs and UDs which are given are actually comparable. So that's one of the main reasons for it. Uh, later on, if you see the large VMSs, which was the other improvement compute team did, it actually goes beyond beyond a thousand to a thousand at this point. Right. We service fabric don't support it because uh, at that point there are multiple units of deployments which happen. And the FDs and UDs, the logical numbers you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 5 are not comparable. So that's why we have artificially, so the fabric has put a, a constraint on this 100. So hopefully that explains why. Yeah. Later on, yes, there is a desire to go support the large VMSs, then this 100 will go away. We'll also start supporting VMSs which are across AZs. So. And then what about this hub between 1 and 3? 1 and 3. So uh, 1 basically means it's a, it's a it's a test cluster, where basically no reliability whatsoever. You're just basically testing. You can have two. It is just that if you want to spin up a two node cluster, you certainly can. Basically, you'll have one seed node in it. It's no reliable, no more reliable than a one node cluster. Right. And then three node becomes again a, again a, a reliable cluster. We don't support three node in the production in in Azure because of. Uh, the guarantees which we get from fabric controller are not uh, not so strong, but if in on prem three is just fine. Yeah. Cool. And speaking of giant clusters, uh, you mentioned that we had a three thousand five hundred euro cluster with big machines. I probably, as an average user, don't need three thousand five hundred machines, but I may want several hundreds of cores in my cluster. Is it better for me to have smaller amounts of nodes? Uh, and each node being a beefier machine that's more durable or whatever, has more hard disk and I can apply more resource to it, or is it better for me to have lots of small machines running around? So, it, so if you are one of those people who believes in microservices, I would say if you can stitch together a cluster of, of, of smaller machines, you're better off, because basically you just reduced your blast radius to be smaller. So the beefier machines, Tend to tends tends to take out more of your service. Basically, you can pack the heck out of. It. Otherwise, there's no point. Your your cogs will run out. So, what is the balance in between these two? Right? If you have ten thousand machines, you're going to be upgrading them forever. Versus if there's five, <laughs> then you lost one large machine of sixty four cores. That means you now want to find a new place for that many processes. Right. So that's the balance. So I always say. Uh, there is a balance of, say, when you're reaching a hundred node 
sort of then you should re then you should reevaluate should I go go scale up or scale out a lot of customers just scale out because that's fine because in oh, I'm just all I'm planning to do is two containers in it or two services in it and that's all I can do I don't want to deal with anything else I don't want my CPU to remain idle right so from a pure theoretical perspective smaller is better uh, but from a practical perspective uh, it's just it's a balance in between. Okay, and along the same lines, if I want to have services that are highly available across the entire world, should I set up independent clusters for each continent, or should I have one cluster that spans the whole world? Okay, the global clusters versus so. In theory, if if we had the network connectivity, a global cluster would make sense. But given the geopolitical realities, I don't think. That is going to be for anyone. That answer will not apply to anyone. Sure. Right. So you would most likely be a geopolitical region. You'll have an Americas region. You have a Europe, Asia, and then Australia. I guess most likely. So within those, of course, you can have multiple regions. Uh, in Azure, there are what 15 of them, or in 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 this uh, Americas region. So you can actually span them, uh, and then when you cross the pond. Yeah, it's better not to go across because at the end of the day, you're looking for a high high speed network with cons. As long as you have it, service fabric doesn't prevent you from doing it. Right. Uh, we had done a <coughs> done an incubation with uh, one of the image providers, and I can't name them, uh, who basically had a cluster running in Dublin, East US, and then the West US. And then just for the technology perspective, they just said, "Let me see what happens." So they did do that. So that works. Cool, but you necessarily you'd, you'd say stay away from it for yeah. I would say unless the network improves to a point where you can get guaranteed quads and also uh, you can your services can sustain the latencies uh, and you're allowed to do so. Sure. But a lot of times, like the uh, governments will not allow you to to store some data from Europe, say in, in America. So that's not possible. So then, what's the point? We've all seen the GDPR stuff recently, so yeah, I'm sure it makes sense. Um, one more thing for you on that front. Uh, I was making some clusters in Azure six months ago, and I could make an unsecure cluster, no problem. Now I go to Azure, I just want to make a small cluster to test my stuff. You're making me secure it, add certs, why? Why can't I just have an unsecure cluster for fun? So let me ask you the simple question. Do you leave your house open? No. no what, why is that? I don't want someone stealing my stuff. Isn't that applied to your cluster you're paying for? That's what I mean. Simplest, simply put, that is the reason. So, and then of course, like for example, there were like multiple other vendors uh, whose clusters and and software got taken hostage. And once that happens, it is a very bad thing not only for the company but also for the provider. So we just wanted to take the high road by saying, well. Nothing in us in our cluster. We tried the unsecure; it was great, but uh, we were just proved to be lucky. It's all I would say. Otherwise, uh, there's, uh, we were just lucky that we no one took over any of our customer clusters, right? So that's that's one of the reasons why we just switched uh, to un to secure. Yeah. And then we we're trying to make it even better. Uh, I'm sure it is a little difficult now. I totally understand that feedback, but. Uh, it's better than leaving the house door open. Fair enough. But on premises, I'm allowed to deploy unsecure clusters. Please don't. <laughs> uh, you that should. is my actual house. No? <laughs> yeah. So on prem, the key things is the, the on prem. Most of the tier one customers who are there, they are their data centers are operated like Fort Knox. They are, they nothing comes in. Right. In fact, they, I I have problems even getting the telemetry out. So. Uh, maybe that's that's why it's okay, but even there, I just believe I I don't want a, a Snowden effect, right? So that's what we call it now. So yeah. so we do want it, want it secure. Uh, trust no one is what I would say. So okay. please don't do unsecure clusters. Okay. And speaking of security, we have you can use certificates or you can use some kind of Active Directory. So talking about certificates for a second, I create a cluster, I configure a certificate in a key vault. In that certificate, once my cluster comes up, I see that it's not only the client to service certificate, but it's also the server to service certificate. Is that recommended? Should I just move to production with that? Is that fine? So, two things. Right? So in Azure, uh, we allow you to do two things. So basically, once it's I mean, from a pure security perspective, it's always better to have 
different certificates for different purposes. It's for the sake of simplicity that we just made them all the same, right? So in Azure, the cluster and the server certs are actually certificates, but the rest of them, the client side of the operations can be can be secured by AAD. So I, that is the right combination you should use and keep the cl cluster cert as a break class scenario. And when it comes to on-prem, uh, I would think uh, we, I mean, we support AD full full fledged, so you should use ADs for your machines. Uh, you should use AD for access. That's what I would say. Right. And last question: uh, What is your one piece of advice to anybody about anything? Anybody of any? Okay, that's just open ended. <laughs> All right. So I'll stick to service fabric. That's the best. So, sure. So the biggest call generators for us are are certificates expiring. Please, don't let that happen. You don't want to be locked out of your clusters and then create uh, life site for yourself, your frustration for your you and your management, and also us. Take care of it. There is a there is a trace which is which is written now. There is an alert which is there. We also have such notifications. Take care of it. That's that's one advice I have. Don't let your certs expire. Don't let your certs expire. And don't leave your house unlocked when you leave. Uh, yeah, that's a big one. Right. Thank you for that. Hey, you're welcome. Take care.